Thanks, everyone, um, and welcome to our presentation of the Real Affordability Index. Uh, my name is Claire Patterson, and I'm the Communication Specialist from Youthful Cities. Uh, and I am Fidu Madiri, and I am the Senior Data Analyst at Youthful Cities. Um, we're really excited for today's presentation and having you all here to join us. Uh, before we go really into our presentation, we really want to acknowledge the, uh, the territory and ancestor territory we're all in, even though we're in this virtual setting. Um, I'm going to invite all of you uh, to use this link to find out uh, your uh, individual uh, territories that you occupy. And if you feel comfortable, we would love it if you could share it in the chat with all of us. And we just wanted to share that um, it's really important that we consider the land that we're on because we're considering affordability and equity and we should be considering the uh, past inequities uh, across our nations and our cities when we discuss this. Um, perfect, and uh, we shared the link in the chat there so we can reflect on that. Um, but a bit about us, Youthful Cities, we're a uh, think and do tank. And we're based on making data-driven solutions for young people. We focus on uh, making cities more youthful and with that, the issues that youth um, face in cities. And one of those major issues is affordability. And we wanted to find out what the most affordable city in Canada was for young people. That drove us to partnering with Future Launch at RBC and we uh, conducted the index to find out uh, the most affordable city in Canada. Uh, so today we're going to be looking at the Real Affordability Index and our schedule for this meeting is to first introduce the Affordability Index and then Fiduma will take you through the methodology behind the data collection. We'll explore the data and some of the headlines and findings and then humanize the data and uh, talk about the targets that we've set for the future. And then there'll be a short Q&A session where you can ask any uh, data driven questions that you might have. So. Uh, the Real Affordability Index considers 27 cities all across Canada. We use 54 measurements to measure and ended up with 2,414 data points. Uh, and below you can see the rankings of the cities for our overall affordability. Um, and even though we originally set out to find the most affordable city in Canada, by looking at this graph, you can clearly see that uh, no cities in Canada were affordable that in fact, uh, 15 to 29 year olds actually make an average monthly deficit of $750. Uh, we wanted everyone to have a solid understanding of the methodology that went into developing the uh, real affordability index. Um, next slide. Uh, the index provides an insight into how much uh, Canadian youth uh, make in a month within the 27 cities that we looked at. We're accounting for their monthly expenses as well as their income. Once we have developed uh, the cost and the income, uh, once we uh, um, cal uh, calculated it, our team was able to create an overall ranking system uh, for the 27 cities, which helped us really determine uh, which of those cities can young people really live, move, uh, and thrive in uh, affordably. Next slide. In terms of the uh, our calculation into income, uh, we use the Statistic Canada's uh, labor uh, force survey, uh, which helped us to get an average of the income of young people between uh, 15 and 29. Uh, we analyzed their income by using CMA uh, by provide uh, by applying like an average of their provincial and federal income tax rate to provide us like an estimation of how much they would make in a given month. Um, also, it's really important to note that uh, Statistic Canada provides hourly wage figures in their uh, labor first survey. Uh, so we had to take account the average working hours that young people usually work uh, that represents like a full time or part time uh, income. Next slide, please. Uh, we also use about nine cities that we looked at. We use the CMA data. Uh, the reason for that is, uh, is that we felt that it was the most accurate way to, um, to determine the income for that city, where if that city's available, it wasn't available, we use their in uh, provincial income. Uh, we noticed that the CMA income was much higher 
than other uh, provincial incomes. We were unsure if that was due to, uh, for example, the population size of the CMA cities or if low incomes in rural area of the province. Uh, however, we weren't able to come with an indefinite answer to that. Next slide. Uh, in terms of our calculation that went into uh, cost, when we were looking at costs, we kind of wanted to identify about four categories uh, because we want young people not just to, uh, to get the bare minimum, but also really thrive. So we looked at anything that would fall into the buckets of live, move, uh, work, and play. Next slide. So now we're going to go through the findings and I'll share some of our headline findings that came out of the index. So we found that Lethbridge has the smallest deficit at $32.92 lost per month, but we can't celebrate this small deficit because Lethbridge also has the largest gender wage gap for affordability at 20%. We also found that cost of living varies by 30% between the most expensive place to live, which is Yellowknife, and the least expensive, which is Halifax. We also found that the highest percentage of young people work in sales and services. Manitoba and the Maritimes have some of the lowest incomes. Young men continue to earn more than young women in every city. And that the minimum wage proves not to be enough to live off in each city. And all this together paints the picture that young people currently can't afford to live in cities in Canada, whether those cities are big or small. So here we can see some of the top rankings for the highest income, lowest rent, lowest cost of living, lowest gender wage gap, and the highest amount of full-time jobs. So we're gonna be looking at the cost of living, income and overall affordability in the next following graphs. And uh, one of the key takeaways that we found from this data was that young people are making an average deficit of $750 a month in all the indexed cities across Canada. Uh, so when we looked at uh, income between young people from 15 to 29, we noticed a couple of things. One being that most of the cities that had the lower income tend to be in the East Coast. Uh, we also noticed that um, cities Major, like many cities in Alberta were at the top uh, of the list for income. And that's uh, due to the fact that there's more favorable income tax rates in that province. Uh, we also noticed that uh, Yellowknife being the at the top, um, having the highest income is very consistent with uh, previous indexes that we have done in the past, like our urban work index. Uh, and those are the greater number of incentives uh, that the government provides to encouraging people to move to the city, uh, it's, it could be due to that, why their income is higher in that, that city. Uh, in terms of cost, uh, we noticed that, uh, that one of the biggest contributing factors that uh, affect young people is the cost of housing and education. Um, for example, the, in the city of Quebec and Lethbridge, uh, the average rent prices is below $1,000. Uh, if you compare it to here in Toronto, uh, where I am, the average uh, cost of rent, especially in the downtown core area, is roughly about $2,000. And if you're looking at outs the outskirts, that would be about $1,700. Uh, and those were the two driving forces of cost. Next slide. When we basically looked at uh, when we looked at income and costs and subtracted it, we uh, ranked the cities to determine which one had the greatest surplus or deficit uh, in terms of youth spending. Uh, young people making less, it's uh, costing them. Uh, we young people that uh, that that sorry uh, make less. We noticed that is Lethbridge uh, being the worst case scenario is uh, Halifax at the bottom of the list making it more expensive. Uh, next, we looked at what types of jobs young people are engaged in. And we found that many young people across Canada are working service jobs, which uh, forces them to continue earning a minimum wage, which is one of the reasons why uh, cities across Canada aren't affordable. Uh, yes, as, as Claire mentioned, yes, young people in the 27 cities that we looked at, are work, majority of them are working in service uh, 
uh, sales or service uh, sector. And those jobs tend to have the lowest rate uh, wages, especially in the retail area. We notice there's a correlation of if a, a city has a higher income, those uh, cities, oftentimes their young people work in uh, the trade sector. Um, yeah. We also examined uh, um, statistics based on sex and found that young men continue to earn a higher income than young women in all of the examined cities. Uh, we really want to point out that when we are looking at the statistics on female and male, uh, we were using Stats Canada, which really doesn't uh, only offers demographic statistic by sex and not gender, which limited our ability to look further into non-binary identities. Uh, so our stats is really people that identify as female or male. Um, and we notice that no matter what city young people live in, women make less than men. Even if men are experiencing uh, affordability deficit, women are experiencing it much higher. Uh, and that could be due to the fact that a lot of uh, women are notoriously paying more for certain products and uh, it could do, be due to the pink tax. Next slide, please. We also found that uh, Canada's most affordable city, which was Lethbridge, also has the largest gender affordability gap. Uh, we conducted a couple of sen uh, sensitivity analysis. Our first one looking at female and male. Uh, we noticed that uh, Yellowknife and Lethbridge stands out when it comes to cities with the highest uh, income disparity between men and women, both of them making it roughly about 20%, men are making roughly about 20% than um, a woman. Uh, and we noticed that the range of difference between both those genders are 1% to 9% those sexes. We also looked at uh, what type of uh, work that young people are engaged in, whether it's full-time, part-time, or that the young people are unemployed. We found that even young people who work full-time aren't guaranteed to afford the city that they live in. Yes, uh, our sensitivity analysis looking at both of these uh, employment statuses, uh, our key takeaway was that um, there's still so many other cities where young people are working full time, but do not achieve a surplus, despite the fact that they're also working full time. Uh, even in those cities that are uh, up here that you say are green, that doesn't really, a lot of young people still might not experience the, uh, the aspiration of buying a home, uh, you know, starting a family early. Uh, they're still uh, experiencing discomfort and financial aspirations. Um, so we also looked at minimum wage. Um, and we found that in all of the examined cities, the minimum wage is not a livable wage. We found that uh, gaps between the minimum and livable wage range from two to $10. Yeah, so it doesn't really matter what city uh, within the 27 young people live in, they still are not making a, a livable wage. Um, young people are still struggling uh, to thrive, uh, regardless if they work full-time or part-time. Uh, that doesn't really make a huge change uh, for them. Next slide. So we also looked at uh, gender ranges and gender range gaps. Um, we found that young people don't make enough to earn a surplus in Canadian cities until they're between 25 and 29. Uh, if we look at the last uh, age group, the 25 and 29, uh, there is some surplus showing in monthly earning. Uh, and this is a good thing because that's around like a pivot of time in their lives. Uh, uh, when young people are, you know, those are the times when young people are considering uh, buying their first home or starting a family, but the numbers don't really indicate uh, comfortability financially for them. There's still, there is this insecurity around that. Slide. So uh, we also wanted to share a personal story because it's, uh, it's easy to look at numbers and forget that these are actually the youth that are living in our country. So, um, from one of the pivot members from a previous youthful cities program uh, who is Toronto based, they said, there are a lot of things to take into account when you think about cost of living. You have to think about rent, paying for food, paying for public transport, or if you have a car, paying for that. 
Insurance rates are high, public transport costs increase every year, the cost of living increases every year, and then we just do not increase proportionately. So the real affordability index takes into account what it really costs for young people to live in cities across Canada, and it paints a picture of what happens when income does not increase proportionately with cost of living. The unaffordability for young people to survive and thrive in Canadian cities will have ripple effects across the country. So we have to act now because young people are the future of our cities. And we set some targets um, that will bring young people closer to affordability. The targets are set for the next three years and take into account a 6.7% increase in inflation. Um, so we need young people to achieve 66% full-time jobs between the age range of 15 and 24. We need to boost minimum wage by $5 in every province and territory. And we need to reduce costs, reducing the cost of education by 15%, public transit by 25%, and rental housing by 20%. And uh, now I'm gonna share some links with you because we have a really great affordability app where young people can put in their own personal costs, um, including the city that they live in uh, and their income to find out um, what affordability means for them, what the most affordable city for them to live in is. Um, and you can check out the app, it's in English and French. So I'm gonna put that into the chat and then we can move into a question and answer period where you can ask us any questions you might have or share some uh, insights that you found interesting from the presentation. I was uh, busily writing possible questions while you were <laughs> making your presentation. Thank you both very much. Um, I, one I could cross off right away, uh, the part-time versus full-time uh, thing. Uh, thank you for addressing that. Um, do you have um, any plans or have you been able to de delve into this in a historical sense, like over time? Because of course we all have the anecdotal notion that this problem has gotten a lot worse um but it would be good to put it into some kind of perspective um because it seems to me that young people always have historically like started out at a bit of a deficit coming into the city and depended on intergenerational transfers or student loans or that sort of thing until they can uh, find their feet uh but everything just seems more acute these days um so i throw that out there for you both that's a good question. Um, we haven't been able to do a full analysis historically, um, bearing on different generations, but it is an important question and it's important to consider if it, it really does feel different. And I think to all those who are in an older generation, I would ask the following questions, which I'm going to put into the chat. So I would want to ask older generations, which of the following did you have in your 20s? A student loan, mm -hmm. a net loss of $9,000 per year after expenses, mm -hmm. a single income until your late 20s, a rental cost that is 23.1% of your monthly cost of living, and no affordable cities to live in across Canada. Hmm. As you say, it's, it's quite acute at this stage. And uh, I think that would, um, that sort of uh, historical just a, maybe a snapshot even would sort of uh, allay because you know how old people are <laughs> like like me oh you know when I was a kid we just sort of ate coal and walked 20 miles to go to school kind of thing um but no it's it is different now I, I even see it and feel it so uh, this, so this is a very valuable analysis um back in the day when I worked in Niagara I volunteered for something called the living wage committee um and they're, they exist in a number of cities across Ontario, and they do a calculation based on probably similar data to the stuff that you uh, analyzed uh, of the living wage. Um, forgive me if you've already touched upon this, but did you uh, did you actually consult maybe uh, such studies for individual cities in the course of your research? Uh, Fidumu, I'll let you answer this one. Um, can you repeat the ending of your question? Sorry, I didn't catch. Oh, did did you uh, did you ever encounter the living wage calculations uh, that had been done by anti-poverty groups um, when you were looking into these cities? 
Um, I don't think so. I think I'll, I'll, when we were looking at income, we were just kind of looking at the current um, income that young people make in that in, in, within the year, within the past couple of years. It's more of a calculation of expenses that are necessary to thrive and not just survive kind of thing. That's what the living wage is defined as. Um, it might save you some time actually in the future if you're ever to run this again. Um, in terms of, well. sorry, uh, in terms of like the, like the living wage, when we looked at like when I said live, play and work, uh, we, we took a survey from young people and they kind of gave us um, how they spend their money monthly. Uh, and then we kind of did uh, analysis on looking at how much those things cost, uh, like the like if you know they would put in like subscription. So we would calculate uh, the different types of subscription they use. Uh, so that's kind of how we determine their cost of living uh, within a month. So you got primary data. That's that's excellent. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, do you have a wish list for data that you'd like to gather or receive somehow uh, that would maybe enhance uh, future such studies? I think what we're right now really interested is looking at it globally, like how other cities, um, how they perform in terms of affordability. It's something we want to expand into. Uh, and I do think even doing a little historical analysis will also help us just to kind of understand uh, just kind of how far we've gone. Uh, so I think that's something else we might be uh, wanting to look at in the future. That would be great. And uh, I know we'd be happy to help you uh, look for any data or connect you with people who are getting that data in the future, if you'd like. Um, it's kind of what we're hoping we'll do as the Open Data Society going forward. Um, I, I don't have too many more questions, honestly. Uh, this is a very tight and efficient presentation. Thank you very much, both of you, for this. Um, uh, what I like most about it, really, is just it's so timely. I mean, this the crisis is now. And just like a year and a half, no, wait, um, what was it? How long has this pandemic been going on for? I kind of lost track. Um, mm, two years? OK. so. A year ago, <laughs> we had a presentation called "A Year of uh, COVID nineteen Open Data," and uh, and and you know that was just that was something that had legs. People came back and, and looked at that and and were interested in what the presenter had to say going forward, uh, just because it was affecting all of us just as this will. I feel like we're even a little bit ahead of the curve with this presentation uh, because you know, people who have accumulated a bid or have already bought their home or whatever, I'm not one of them, by the way, uh, <laughs> they maybe are not feeling these pinches so much as young people are. And, and so, as I mentioned before, they may find it a little easier to, uh, to dismiss it. But I look forward to actually uh, talk, tackling this topic in, in greater depth with you in the future, if you care to, uh, because I think the awareness shall only grow uh, of this topic. Um, it, I guess my last question almost uh, maybe will be like, what would you like to study in future uh, uh, to, to maybe make things better for people in Canada? Just a wish list. I won't hold you to it, I swear. Um, I'll share uh, broadly, I'm really interested in climate, climate change, mm -hmm. the climate crisis. So that's something I'm interested uh, in doing further studies and data on. How about you, Fadumo? Uh, yeah, me too. I mean, we're hoping our next index would be about climate, uh, but uh, that might change, so we'll see. Yeah. We're thinking that uh, at our next annual conference, uh, one of the major themes will be uh, climate change and the practitioners who uh, gather the data and open it to uh, public scrutiny. Uh, I, I, reasonably confident there'll be a large part of this conference. And I, I feel like the costs are actually becoming readily apparent, like the storm we had last weekend. Uh, I, I Fortunately, I've lived very close to the lake, so I somehow that cushioned us. But I saw on the news just how torn up uh, everything was and how Ottawa is still laboring without power. And there's, there's real cost to that. People have to buy generators, people have to do without. Uh, and, and those things are only going to uh, mount uh, in, in the future. So I think, uh, I hope uh, rather that uh, you uh, gain your wish 
that uh, you uh, get the chance to to study these things and we'll be very happy to to learn of these uh, developments in the future um if anyone has any other questions uh hopefully i stirred the pot a little bit feel free to take yourself off mute or put it in the chat let's see mm -hmm. okay well uh I guess that means your presentation was fairly comprehensive. So uh, thank you both very much uh, for joining us today. Uh, we will be giving this uh, airtime on YouTube in the near future and I'm promoting it on social media. And uh, we look forward to uh, staying in touch. Um, Thanks so much for having